Welcome to a segment of AME's Social Responsibility and Community Engagement video series. These videos provide AME members with leading practice examples and tips in achieving a high level of corporate social responsibility and in working effectively with people and communities around mineral exploration and development projects. In this video, we will hear from Robert Simpson with PR Associates, who will talk about effectively communicating science, engineering, and technical information to communities and non-technical stakeholders. These days, to get support for mineral exploration projects, effective communication with communities, governments, and Indigenous groups is critical. Now, during the mining cycle, from the earliest stages all the way through to closure, scientists, engineers, and technical people are often called on to speak to communities, governments, and Indigenous groups. And many of those groups, the individuals are non-scientists and non-technical. In these situations, your success depends on how well you can deliver that information to a non-science audience so it's understood. To do this, scientists, engineers, and technical experts need to present very complex information in terms that people can understand because ultimately well-delivered information results in informed decision-making. So let's begin by looking at what constitutes good communication. By looking at this diagram, what we call the communication cycle, you can see that the cycle begins at the top with someone sending a message. For the purposes of this exercise, let's say that's you, and you're trying to explain the significance of your most recent drill results or your engineering plans for a tailings impoundment to a community group. Or more practically, Let's say you're a parent speaking to your four-year-old child and your message is, don't touch the red-hot burner on the stove because it's hot and you'll burn yourself. Now you see as we make our way around the communication cycle clockwise that to the immediate right of the sender, who is you, is what we call a filter. Now filters are interesting and complex things. These are the things that hinder your listener from understanding the message you're trying to deliver. And if your listener doesn't understand the message that you're trying to deliver, they can't be expected to do what you're asking them to. In this case, accept your point of view or not touch the hot burner on the stove. What we have then is what we call in our business a communication breakdown. Barriers to communication or filters include things like the physical barriers or the psychological barriers, emotional or cultural barriers, listening barriers or not listening. A barrier or filter many parents who have four-year-olds clearly understand. And language barriers, which we're here to talk about today. So to summarize, to communicate effectively, the first thing you need to do is consider what your audience filters are and how you can break through those filters so that you can communicate effectively. In this case, how do you explain very complex science to people with little or no comprehension of science? Let me give you a recent example of what I mean. So recently I attended a community meeting where there was a group of elders and an exploration, the, the president of an exploration company. The president of the exploration company was there to explain what had happened over the, over the previous exploration season. Now, one of the things that happened during the season was that about 200 gallons of diesel fuel had spilled over the top of a tank. Uh, one of the employees had left the valve open, uh, the tank overflowed. Uh, however, the majority of the, of, of the diesel fuel was collected in, in, in a pool that was, was placed around the bottom of the tank. And about 15 gallons of the, of the diesel fuel spilled over the tank into the soil around, which later the company removed the topsoil and replaced it. Sounds like it should have been an easy explanation, but it wasn't. Let me tell you what happened. The president of the company, who's a well-known chemical engineer, found herself in front of an audience that she wasn't prepared for. So what happened was, as often happens, is she fell back on what she knew best, which was chemical engineering. That's the place that she felt most comfortable, was from a chemical engineer's perspective. The president started by saying, we have several tanks on our acceleration project. They're made of steel, therefore they're not corrosive. The tanks in question are used to store hydrocarbons. And as a result of an error that one of our employees made by not shutting off a valve in time, almost 200 gallons of hydrocarbon leaked into the receiving environment. As you can imagine, the room went quiet. The hydrocarbons, she went on, were impeded from leaching into the stream because of a three-meter berm 
that the company had built around the storage tanks. By this time, you can imagine the tension in the room was palatable. People talked over one another, people shouted, uh, shouted questions, and the man sitting next to me pounded his fist on the table and demanded an explanation for who was responsible. Then someone shouted from the back of the room, we can't trust you. We never wanted you on our land in the first place. We want you off our land now. The defeated CEO, who stood with her shoulders shrugged, actually didn't know what had, what had transpired. Then finally, after a number of questions, an elder at the front of the room raised her hand and asked the CEO, what are hydrocarbons? And are they dangerous? And will they affect our health? Now to the CEO's surprise, chemical engineer, uh, her answer was a bit abrupt when she said that hydrocarbons are natural elements that you find in the environment. Now what the communication person did was she stepped in and she explained to the group that what they were talking about was diesel fuel. And that 200 gallons of diesel fuel had spilled but most of it had been collected in a, in a pool underneath the tanks and only 15 gallons of diesel fuel had actually spilled over the top into the topsoil. And that 15 gallons of diesel fuel was just about enough to fill a half ton truck. So what happened was the crowd settled down. People knew what diesel fuel was. People knew how much 15 gallons of diesel fuel was. They knew what a tank of diesel fuel in their truck looked like and the concern level went down. However, the next question was, what is receiving environment? But I think you get my point. Now, while that may have sounded like a simple example, I think the one thing that's important to remember is that in Canada, the average non-scientist retains about a grade six level comprehension of science. So in order for you as an engineer, a scientist, or a technical expert to break through the first communication filter, you need to be able to explain science at a level that people can comprehend. Diesel fuel or hydrocarbons is a simple example. Imagine terms like electromagnetic radiation, ARD, dust particulate, tailings dump, risk factors, country foods. Imagine what all of those kind of images, those bring up with people that are non-scientists. Let me give you one more very brief example. A community group was concerned about a proposed tailings dam. Rumor had circulated around the, the community that the Tailings Dam would be the height of the Hoover Dam and hold back twice the amount of water, toxic water, that the Hoover Dam holds back. Now the image that was created was a concrete dam holding back billions of gallons of water. Now the company spokesperson knew these rumors had been circulating throughout the community and when he arrived at the community meeting, he hoped that he was going to be able to alleviate the concerns. So rather than bringing along his engineering team, to show engineering diagrams, what he did was he created a very simple demonstration. He took the project, broke it down to scale, brought two two by fours, or put two two by fours together in a V shape, which represented the valley that the tailings impoundment would be in. Uh, it was permeable stone on both sides. A small pool of water, which he put in the middle of the meter and a half two by fours. He brought three pails of sand, the kind of pails that children play with on the beach. When the question came up about tailings impoundments, he took the opportunity to do a small experiment and demonstration. He showed them where the water would go in a small pool in the middle. He took the pails of sand and he poured it on both sides, which represented 2.5 kilometers on both sides of the tailings impoundment. He also showed them that Within that 2.5 kilometers of sand, every 500 meters, there would be a concrete wall that would be built. And the concrete wall was two and a half feet across. And that would, that would prevent any water that, from a flood event that would, would perhaps leak from the top of the tailings impoundment from leaching or, or leaking into the receiving environment. So as you can imagine, this simple demonstration changed the tenor in the room. People's fears of a Hoover Dam failing were alleviated. And over time, after the engineers, the scientists, and the technical experts continued to meet with the community, the project won overwhelming support and received an environmental assessment. So how does an effective spokesperson prepare? First and most importantly, 
a good spokesperson knows their audience. Let's go back to the parent example of telling their children not to touch the burner on the stove. Let's say you told your four-year-old this way. Don't touch the circular heating element insulated with compressed magnesia and sheathed in a spiral metal tube when it's red because you'll burn yourself. I think it's fair to say we all know what the results would be. They wouldn't be the results that we had hoped. Now if we go back to the effective communication cycle, you'll see that effective communication is delivering your message, breaking through the filters so your receiver understands your message, and the outcomes or the actions are what you desired and are measurable. Now consider as a parent explaining to your four-year-old child by showing them a red hot burner on the stove, allowing them to put their hand close enough to the heat that they could feel it, and then explaining to them that if it gets closer it will burn. I'm sure the outcome would be much different. The same goes for communicating science with non-scientists. If you speak the same language or demonstrate in terms that people can understand, there's a higher likelihood that people will be able to make informed decisions. Decisions that you would like them to make. So let's look at that communication cycle one more time. The sender sends the message, don't touch the hot stove. The amount of diesel fuel spilled equals one half ton truck tank. The tailings dam is actually two and a half kilometers of compacted sand. The receiver gets the message, filters it against their own biases and their own norms, and then does something. So to summarize, once you understand your target group, the content and language of your communication needs to be tailored to the audience's understanding level. Begin tailoring by understanding the world from their perspective. Align messages with what the audience needs. Remove the jargon. Engage the reactions as you process through your presentation. It also helps to select attractive and visually appealing communication tools or develop small demonstrations. Remember that the audience is constantly evaluating you. They evaluate you on your visual, your voice, and your words. And most importantly, Good communication takes time to create and practice to deliver. Now, if you deliver your science in an understandable way, people will be more likely to do what you're asking them to do, and that's accept your point of view. Thank you for watching this AME video. We have a wide range of information and resources on our website to support the mineral exploration and development sector. We encourage you to review our website regularly. If you have any comments or feedback, please feel free to contact us at info at amebc.ca. Thank you.